Hello everyone, and welcome back to the adventure. Last we left off, Constantine was in your Vasker, being requested by Skewer for a mission. It's time to see what he wants. It appears that Vilkis is having a rather in-depth conversation with Rita about stances and fighting. They seem deep in conversation, and while she does have a tendency to work alone, Constantine can't help but feel a small twinge of jealousy for the companionship they seem to hold for each other. No time to rest on those thoughts of companionship, though. She has been specifically requested for a mission, so it's best not to disappoint. She finds Skior down below, who informs her that this is going to be her induction test. Apparently, Constantine was not yet officially a part of the Companions. She was more of, like, uh, an intern. This was to be her official test. We're to travel to a grave burrow with Farkas in search of something known as a Fragment of Luthrad. Apparently, the honor of the Companions relies on it, being able to retrieve this one little fragment of a massive blade. Honestly, it seems a little childish and almost below her skills, but hey, you know what? If it gets her into the group, she's not going to argue. She's simply going to use this as a show of her skill and hopefully keep pushing her forward. It's late in the day, and grabbing Farkas now to head out just seems unnecessary. While there was some level of urgency in Skewer's voice, if this weapon has been in fragments for centuries, it can wait another day. Constantine heads to the barrack area, sits down, and studies a bit more magic, and will then fall asleep. Heck, we got a grave to rob in the morning. After a quick breakfast of champions, that being of course salmon and water, we find Farkas, who we talk to and mention what our plan is. He appears a man of action rather than words, and so appears told, more keen to just get going. Press. And so we do. This will be the first time in a long You'll while that Constantine has ever worked with somebody again. As the pair head towards the barrow, Constantine reminisces. She remembers working with another warrior, a man's name who she can't remember, about a year ago on a bounty. It wasn't a particularly difficult bounty, at first. Clear out some bandits and just bring proof of death. The warrior was inexperienced. It was actually his first time working as a mercenary, and he asked if she would be willing to take him on as an apprentice. He had heard about her from innkeepers and that she might be a good teacher. Originally skeptical, she rationalized it as an extra sword to help her out, and if things got hairy, well, an extra sword's an extra sword. If he did a good job, who knows, maybe she could get a traveling companion. He wouldn't live to see his next sunrise. The two had approached the camp cautiously, it was not a barricaded camp, just a few tents and about five bandits. What Constantine failed to notice was the equipment they were wearing, or in this case, lack thereof. This was a mage bandit camp. Mages are difficult adversaries, and Constantine's grasp of magic was limited. She would have to use her bow. She could not use her sword. They'd cut her to pieces. The other warrior had no bow, just a sword. She told him to stay down and follow her lead. She picked off the first, second, and third with two left. The warrior got impatient. He drew his sword and charged. Constantine was not stupid. She did not run after him. She just kept her bow ready to hit her marks. The warrior didn't make it more than a few meters to the fourth mage when Constantine got a front row seat to an ice spike impaling him in the head. He was dead before he hit the ground. His death, though, was not in vain. The mages, on alert, believing that their friends had died by his hand, relaxed. Constantine used this lapse in judgment to quickly finish the job. She approached the now-dead body of the young warrior and buried him in a small grave. She did not weep or grieve. This was the life of a mercenary, and she hardly knew him. He didn't even remember his name, for God's sake. Why would she be remembering this young warrior at a time like this? Farkas was a strong man and a seasoned fighter, not like the other warrior. She let the thought stand there for a bit until she pushed it away. The rest of the trip, until they reached the barrow, was silence for her. We enter the barrow and come to our first open space. Farkas makes note that there are signs of recent activity. Constantine would have to concur with him. There are pickaxes everywhere and twice dead drawn with boot. Now, who else would be down here? Uh, not totally sure. The pair continues onward into what Constantine assumes to be one of many burial locations. Certain Draugr start to reanimate and attack. The two fight diligently and cut them down to size, with Constantine remembering to pick up some of those weapons for the museum. Ah. 
we continue down when we come across a weird chest. Now, this just looks out of place. And upon attempting to open it, it grows arms and legs and a tongue and holy shit, it's a mimic. This was one of the hardest fights. And even with Farkas, Constantine nearly bit the dust, but she was able to pull through and put the poor thing out of its misery. Now we have to add chests to the things in the ever-growing pile of items trying to kill you in Skyrim. After that close encounter with death, Constantine is on high alert, but she has no time to worry about it as the pair enter a locked room. Looking around, there does appear to be an enchanting table and some loot around the area, but they're locked in due to a gate. Annoyingly, there is no apparent entrance, so Constantine keeps searching. She finally comes across a lever in another room, but when she hits it, BAM! The door slams shut on her. This is not an ideal situation. Constantine couldn't tell if Farkas was annoyed by her actions or not. She was more annoyed at herself now that she needed now some assistance. Farkas goes Don't to try worry, to help Constantine, but then a group of what she assumed what to be presumably bandits Sign showed up. They kept talking like knew they knew Farkas personally, or at least of him in a personal manner. Which one is that? It doesn't matter. He wears that armor, he dies. Killing you will make for an excellent story. That's when before her eyes, he None shed his skin alive and turned into a wolf. Constantine has never come face to face with a werewolf before in all her life. The sight scared her to death as she watched as Farkas shredded the group to pieces. The werewolf then runs away. The door opens and Constantine, for the first time in a while, doesn't know what to do. She is terrified. Was she supposed to know this? Was she going to die here? Did others know? She drew her bow ready to shoot him you. just in case. In fear, she let the arrow it's fly, but in her fear, she shot we wildly like off wild target beasts. and only glanced his armor. Fearsome. To her shock, Farkas oh, seemed no. only the unfazed the by this blood. and explained that only those in the companion. circle have the beast blood. And Eyes not to worry, not the we're only here for the we fragment of Uthrad and Still nothing else. While Constantine noticed no malice, she stayed on edge as they continued through the crypt. As the two delve deeper into the crypt, they approach the more standard burial area. Skeletons and corpses line the walls, but this isn't Constantine's first time in a crypt. She knows the warning signs of Draugr, who are only playing dead. Well, less dead than their brethren. She dispatches them with ease. They also keep coming across the bandits who had attacked Farkas. It seems they're less of a group of bandits and more a group of just werewolf hunters. She finds that they all have silver items on them and cure disease potions. Admittedly, she wasn't sure how much those potions actually helped against lycanthropy, but hey, if it makes them feel better, why not? She wouldn't really have any problem with them. You know, she's not a werewolf, but because she's near Farkas, her proximity to him makes her a threat. She notes down the name of the group, the Silver Hand. She's unsure about what to do with them. On one hand, they are trying to kill her, but on the other hand, they could teach her a lot about lycanthropy. So for now, she'll kill them, and then later on, maybe she'll see what she can do about them. The rest of the crypt is more of the same. Draugr trying to make her one of them, and Silver Hand members trying to make her a Draugr. There are a few chests and trinkets she picks up here and there, but nothing of note. They do come across a random spider den at some point, but they are easily taken care of. As we noted, there really wasn't much of note until they reached the main burial chamber. The main chamber is filled with coffins, but nothing's jumping out at her, which is always a good sign. The creepier part, though, is the chanting she's hearing. Farkas seems to not notice or not care, so either she's losing her sanity or this is all in her head. The chanting gets louder and louder as she approaches a wall with unknown language on it. One of the words is shining a blue color, and once she gets close enough to it, she almost understood the word, like in a primal sense. But that was it. 
and nothing else happened. She looks to Farkas, who looks at her like she's crazy. He clearly saw nothing. Oh boy, is she, is she hallucinating again? It's a possibility. But unsure and unimportant, the fragment of Wuthrat is not only real, it's in front of them. She picks it up, leading to all hell breaking loose. The Draugr keeps spilling out, and it's doing everything the pair can to simply just keep them at bay and not get overrun. A few times, Farkas even had to take a knee, but thanks to Constantine's quick thinking and quicker eye, his immediate threats were taken care of. It feels like an absolute onslaught of never-ending Draugr, until finally, the last one falls and stays down. The two take deep breaths, loot what they can, and exit. The sun had dropped by the time they exited the cairn. Constantine appreciated the cold breeze on her face. The stale tomb air had started to hang in her lungs and she felt suffocated. Or, you know, it was because of the stench of the dead was overpowering. Truly, one or the other. The two continued back to Whiterun, silent. This had turned into far more than a simple tomb raid. She thought back to the young warrior and the failures of companionship she had had in the past. Yet, on this excursion, the two of them worked relatively well together. Not necessarily the person she would want to travel with her, but if she could find an individual who was just as strong, it might be worth having an actual travel partner again. As they reach the gates of Whiterun, a courier comes running up to her. This is the second time they've been able to find her when they needed to. She is now completely convinced they use a tracking spell, though the contents of That's this letter are much Your more intriguing. Only. It seems she has garnered Let's a little see. bit more of a reputation ah, a here in Skyrim, Jarl. and the Moving Jarl Falkreath eh? wants to talk Looks with like her. That's it. Got to go. Constantine learned a long time ago that it's best to give people in power a couple of minutes to talk. They can still be killed all the same if they try anything stupid, but they usually pay the best. Once she's done with the companions here, she may go speak with this Jarl. Finally back within the walls of Whiterun, the pair make it back to Yorvaskar, where Vilkis is waiting. He tells us to follow him as there is a surprise waiting for Constantine. On the other side is Kodlak, Ayla, Skior, and, I mean, obviously Vilkis, who are all in attendance. Because we survived and brought the fragment of Wuthrad back, this was our initiation ceremony. Brothers and sisters of the circle, today we welcome a new soul into our mortal fold. This woman has endured, has challenged, and has shown her valor. Who will speak for her? I stand witness to the courage of the soul before us. Would you raise your shield in her defense? I would stand at her back, that the world might never overtake us. And would you raise your sword in her honor? It stands ready to meet the blood of her foes. And would you raise a mug in her name? I would lead the Song of Triumph as our Mead Hall reveled in her stories. Then the judgment of this circle is complete. Her heart beats with fury and courage have united the companions since the days of the distant green summers. Let it beat with ours, that the mountains may echo and our enemies may tremble at the call. It, it shall, shall be so. so. Well, girl, Constantine genuinely well. appreciated the ceremony. It was won't. small and mostly ceremonial, but she finally, truly felt like she was part of a larger group. Being inducted into the Companions opened up a massive wealth of potential knowledge oh she'd be able to learn yes, from as well. Speaking with Kodlak, he finds it funny that she learned about Farkas' wolf blood, but reassures her that nobody outside the circle is a werewolf, nor, so it seems, does anybody else actually know that. So, gotta keep that a secret. Kodlak bid her farewell, and also told her to get a sword upgrade from Yorland. Before all that, though, it was finally time for Constantine to head to bed, as it had been an incredibly long day. Some may prefer an eternity in his hunting grounds, but I crave the fellowship of Sovngarde. 
Having woken up the next day, Constantine made her decision about the Jarl of Falkreath. She would go and see him, but decided it was high time she actually started to explore Skyrim on foot rather than by carriage. She also quickly picked up a job from Farkas that has her go kill people over in the Reach. She then decided to head to the local inn to stock up. That's when she remembered she had recently picked up another vampire hunting quest. She sat down and read the note. So apparently she is looking for the Sleeping Giant Inn, which is, funny enough, not the Bannered Mare here in Whiterun. She had the faintest, faintest idea where that was, but being more focused on the Falkreath assignment, she didn't really ask around. After acquiring her provisions, she went back to speak with Yorlin as requested by Kodlak. Heading back up to Yorlin was absolutely the right call. Not only did she get a new Skyforged steel sword from the old blacksmith, she also inquired about his desire to teach her. He was more than happy for a fee, of course, and after spending some gold and time with the man, she gained some newfound knowledge when it came to the art of smithing. It was now, finally, time to head out. Hitting the open road felt good. Constantine's map had Falkreath as somewhere in the south, though where exactly was unknown. She cared little, though. She was just happy to be traveling again. The past few days had been a lot. From a vampire hunt, to the companion's initiation, to now being summoned by a Jarl of all people? It was truly a lot to take in for someone who was still so new to Skyrim. She did have to give herself props, though. She'd helped open a new museum in Solitude, and that in and of itself was worth staying for. She already had a base of operations in Solitude anyways, and a eh, halfway decent one in right, Whiterun. The hope now, sort of, was that she could start acquiring more strongholds in the other holds to help ease her travels and always have somewhere to rest her head as needed, and as a place to obtain more information for further contracts or, as she's now working in the museum, artifacts. As Constantine crested a hill, she came upon a small village. It wasn't on her map, though that being said, she had very little on it to begin with. The village was known as Riverwood, and all signs pointed to this being a relatively decent living town. It also looked like a well-traveled one. She could hear people mulling about and a blacksmith working in the background. She imagined there was a trader and an inn nearby. That being the case, though, she had just stocked up on provisions, so her plan was originally to just pass through. That is, until she saw the sign on the inn, the Sleeping Giant Inn. She passed by it without taking note, but her mind caught up to what her eyes had already seen, and she realized this was the inn where the vampire was spotted. She was, of course, contract bound to kill this thing, so she turned around right into an orc in armor she had never seen before. He asked her if she'd be interested in joining a group known as the Dawnguard to fight against the growing vampire menace. I mean, it only made sense he would be here, he must have known about the vampire as well, but it seemed he had no luck and was on his way. Constantine jumped at the idea of taking out the vampire threat with an actual group rather than her just doing it herself, and the orc let her know where to meet up. With that out of the way though, it was time for her hunt of the vampire to begin, and hopefully the vampire hadn't actually fled after seeing the orc. The hunt started as the other one had. Constantine had a good idea of how this was going to play out, so she stepped inside and checked around noticing that nobody looked out of the ordinary. Rather than what she did last time, where she outwardly made herself look suspicious, this time she attempted to do the opposite. She hung around, spoke with the patron, and just sort of practiced her alchemy learning the ingredients to a bunch of different items. When testing items, by the way, it's important to be sitting down in case the effects are <clears throat> not ideal. She also spoke with the barkeep and found out about a recent break-in at the, break -in at the trader local trader. Into she the filed that away for later. Break-ins are actually really good stolen. for business as someone is usually Nobody willing to pay for their stolen goods back. There was this one time when someone paid her to get the stolen goods there. back and they didn't pay and now they don't. Well, <clears throat> doesn't matter what happened to them. She got paid. After ingratiating herself into the tavern scene though, she did get herself a room and dropped in bed for the night. Then, as if on cue, upon waking up and opening the door, the vampire was right outside her door. She made no attempts at hiding, unlike the previous one. 
Constantine was sure she was being hunted at this point. She quickly spoke with the vampire to see if any reasonable information could be gleaned from her, but as like the last one, nothing could be acquired. So it would seem in so. partial fear, but also to just be done with her contract, she stepped back into her room quickly and shot, killing the vampire and burning the corpse to make sure it could not rise again. Again, nobody in the tavern seemed to care like at all. Constantine is now sure that the majority of the population are aware, but are afraid to do something if the vampires are not openly hostile. With this contract complete, she is free to continue towards Falkreath. She'll leave the dust for the innkeeper to clean up. As she made her way out of the inn, the light snow began to fall. It was the first hearth fire, signaling the end of spring and the beginning of fall. She can't complain though, she appreciates the cold, though she may need to look into getting a cloak as the days get colder, or at least stocking up on resist cold potions. So as she continued down the path, she heard a faint sound of hammering, and considering how close she is to a town, she assumed this must be the town's mine or something related to Riverwood. How right and wrong she was. As she got closer, she was introduced to the business end of a bunch of banded swords. So there was no contract out for this, you know, mine murder spree, uh, but they attacked her on site meaning that this was now a personal affront to Constantine, something she could not let stand. So she slaughtered them, all of them. The fight started off a lot harder than she first thought. Without warning, she was being attacked on all sides and it was all she could do to get out of the line of fire. Thankfully, Constantine is no stranger to a quick escape and was able to hightail herself out of the mountain, or up the mountain in this case. These bandits were clearly skilled in ambush tactics. She could tell based off of what they had done. But once it came to a prolonged fight, <laughs> uh, they were lacking. Constantine was able from her perch to kill one and she wounded the other and went down the mountain to get a little bit more, you know, close to the second one. Having killed him, she assumed that there would be more inside the mine. Constantine's blood was burning and her bloodlust would be satisfied. Inside the mine, she took stock of her situation. She quickly ate and drank some water before beginning her assault. As she kept going down, she heard the voices of other bandits. She had no way of knowing how many there would be, but she made it a vow on her bloodlust that they would all die by her bow, or sword, or fire. She approached slowly, no reason to be stupid and charge in. She had the element of surprise, and of course, if she could knock a few of them out before getting into melee combat, the better. Upon getting into range, she fired off a good couple shots. They struck their target, but only wounded them. She cursed under her breath. She must have hit armor. The bandits, for their part, were clearly not as brain dead as other ones she'd come across, and they had a pretty good idea where the arrow may have came from. Immediately, they drew blades and headed towards her. A fight was going to begin. On the way in, Constantine had noticed a rockfall trap. She assumed she might be able to use that against her attackers. Here's the problem about traps, though. They're still traps, and if activated improperly, they can still hinder your progress. In her haste, as you saw, Constantine wasn't careful, and while she activated the trap, she also ate shit, cursing as she went down. While recovering, one of the bandits, who did not succumb to the rocks, took a few hits at her. Thankfully, her armor held. All she could do was see red. She would kill everyone in that mine. She looted the corpses for what they were worth and continued onwards. Hearing more hammering, she knew there were still others. They were just waiting their turn to be sent on into the afterlife on an arrow's tip of death. This was the first time in a long time Constantine had, without a contract, assaulted a bandit camp for nothing more than bloodlust. She was usually quite calm and collected, and did a good job of hiding her ferocity. Every once in a while, though, that anger would show. She would try not to think about it deep at night when she was sleeping, but deep down she knew. She reveled in it. She enjoyed it. 
as she hit the lever for the bridge to fall, the bandits heard it. These were smart bastards. They knew something was up. Constantine was absolutely vibrating in her bloodlust. She readied for them to come. She welcomed it. She embraced it. The first two had attacked and they were easy pickings. One was killed before he even made it to her and the second went down with mu without much fanfare either. Yet there were more. There were always more. Constantine continued onward in a trance-like state, but still aware enough to remember her training. She looted a few items as she could, and she turned a corner to a guard. There was no thought, she just put an arrow into him and dinged the armor. She swore. She needed stronger arrows. The steel ones just weren't cutting it. But he attacked, and he fell like the rest of them. She continued her assault. Alright, you're gonna die for that. Then came what can only be called her largest fight to date. She came upon the cistern of the mine with several bandits all around it. Her plan was simple, silently take out as many as she could before the rest overwhelmed her. In the shadows, she was able to thin their numbers a bit but it just wasn't enough. She was overwhelmed and close quarters were not her strong suit. She would run back and forth across the bridge. She was able to get the majority of them in front of her and Constantine is anything if not brazen. She would jump between the ledge and the bridge, the bridge and the water, trying to get them to follow her. She was quick too. She could get them into unfavorable positions and put a few arrows into them. At some point, she switches to blade and magic. Fire is, of course, a better crowd control than an arrow, and she let loose using these same tricks over and over again. For all their intelligence, these bandits were still just that. Weak, pathetic, predictable bandits. They would all fall by her blade and sate her anger, sate her bloodlust. In time, they all fell to her blade, her bow, her magic. This only left this last orc. He was a strong fighter, and he was able to pop a potion mid-fight to regain his health. He was the strongest of the lot by far, and truly made a worthy opponent. But like all his comrades before him, he would know defeat. He would taste oblivion. Constantine looked around and took stock of her work. Several dead, and most likely, if there were any left, they too were dead or fled. The place was clear, and she, she was tired. The anger she once felt dissipated. By her vow, she would make sure that all the bandits were dead, but she knew them to all be dead. It was just a matter of checking, just ticking the boxes. 
she then came upon a rather interesting weapon, a red battle axe simply named the Battle Axe of Hate. Had this item, sensing her nearby, reached out? Had this item influenced her and sent her into the blood rage? She wanted to believe it. Believe that she had simply been influenced, but she knew better. She knew those emotions were her own. She didn't really know what to feel about that either. She found one of the dead, and in a fit of frustration, she burned it, desecrating the body. She needed to leave. She was tired, and there was nothing left for her here. Back outside in the cool air, she felt calm again. She left and headed back towards Riverwood. She was too tired to continue on to Falkreath for the day. She needed rest and food. And that, dear viewers, is where we are going to be leaving our heroine for today. Tired, bloody, and ready for a very, very long nap. Thank you all for watching, and I hope you look forward to episode four, where Constantine will restart her trek to Falkreath. Probably, as the whims of fate are an interesting sort. But with that, may you all have a great rest of your day.